morning. Welcome to Eggs and Issues. I am Ann Frost and I'm the Executive Director of the Chamber and I welcome you. So today we have the local legislatures here. We have Senator Ken Rosenboom, Representative Dustin Height, and Representative Holly Brink. And MC today will be Mayor Dave Kurtzfeldt. Would you please stand as for the presentation of the colors? And would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone this morning uh, to Eggs and Issues. This is a uh, as you know, a tradition that Oskaloosa has where we talk about political issues, whether it be with uh, at the local level, sometimes it's even in the, the niches of things like mental health, uh, all the way up to the state level where we discuss the issues of the day and it's the opportunity to hear the opinions of our legislators but also share our, our opinions and also our uh, intelligence and best wisdom with them. Uh, we want to say a special thank you to the American Legion for the presentation of the colors this morning. Uh, also, we want to thank KBOE and KMZN for their news coverage, the Oskaloosa News, Oskaloosa Herald, and the New Sharon Sun for their news coverage, uh, Smoky Row for providing the venue for this, uh, Midwest One, of course, Sandy, thank you for the complimentary coffee, it's always delicious, and also uh, the sound system we're working with from the George Daly Auditorium. So we appreciate uh, the support that we have to make this event possible. Uh, we have with us this morning uh, Senator Kent Rosenboom, also Representative uh, Dustin Height, and also Representative Holly Brink. Uh, and so uh, let's, let's go ahead and get started with some opening comments. Uh, tell us what's on your mind. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming out today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Representative Dustin Height. I represent the uh, western part of Mahaska County, all of the city of Oskaloosa and University Park, as well as uh, Lake Prairie Township and the city of Pella in Marion County. Um, just, a, just a few thoughts on uh, what I've got going on up at the Capitol. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of things uh, coming down the pipeline uh, that cover a broad range of topics. Um, those of us, you know, we get... Uh, we get on certain committees and we know about certain things and deal with certain things. And so one of the biggest things, and I think you've all heard me talk about this for a couple of years now, it, that I'm working on, and there's a group of us working on in the house, is broadband internet uh, in rural Iowa. And we've, we've got kind of a multifaceted approach, what we're looking at, because there's no silver bullet. Um, for, those, uh, for those of you... Um, who are lucky enough to live in the city of Oskaloosa, Fremont, New Sharon. You know, we don't, we don't have a broadband problem because, uh, thanks to MCG, but much of Iowa, much of rural Iowa does. Uh, we don't have high-speed internet where it's needed, and it's needed for a lot of reasons. It's needed for the businesses that are ordering and taking orders. Uh, it's needed for our students when they go home and they do their homework at night. Uh, and, you know, as I, I like to joke, it's needed for the parents so their kids can watch Netflix. So uh, some of the t things that we're looking at to, to help address that is, is number one, to continue the broadband grants uh, that we uh, put $5 million towards last year. And what we're really doing on that is trying to hone down on, on, the, um, on the specifications and, and, the, uh, and the grading criteria for the grant applications so that we're really spending the money on, on well worth it projects, projects that serve underserved and, and unserved areas. Uh, but they are also uh, hopefully future proof so that you know we can we can take whatever we've invested in it and uh, expand that in the future we're looking at uh, implementing a telecommunications ready or broadband ready program it's similar to home base Iowa where a community can um, 
asked to become designated as one of these uh, special designations. And we're looking at what criteria we want to, to do that and what, um, who we want to make that designation so that it really means something. So when businesses are looking at places to locate, they can look and say, this community has the connectivity that we need. And when people are looking to find a place to live, they can say, this is the place where uh, it has the connectivity that we need. I mean, you know, that telecommuter ready thing I think is big. If we look into the future, I, you know, I could see a GM executive living and working in the city of Oskaloosa from home. I mean, that's, that's the way of the future, and so we, we certainly want to be part of that. And the other big, the other big thing we're looking at is, is, you know, we've got this great fiber optic network throughout the state called the ICN. Um, but right now it's limited to um, schools, hospitals, the National Guard, and state offices. And so we're looking at what, using that, leveraging that, to help expand uh, broadband to areas that are underserved. So that's, that's really uh, what I've been spending a, a lot of my time on. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Representative Brink and then uh, certainly answer any questions. Thank you. Um, this year has started off um, quite busy, as some of you can see. I am Vice Chair of Appropriations, Vice Chair of Economic Growth, um, Vice Chair of Rules and Regs, also um, stepped up as an Assistant Majority Leader um, for my caucus. Um, so I have definitely done a learning curve trying to swarm myself with the entire state budget and learn the ins and outs of it. Um, on top of working on several different legislation pieces in the interim, I've spent a lot of time on the daycare crisis um, and the problems we have not just here, but in our entire state, from access to affordability, um, the cliff effect, and so we've been working really hard on that, and I've traveled the state talking with other individuals as well as many through my district. Um, I guess my district is Appanoose County, Monroe County. I have a little bit of the south, the west, and the north side of Wapalo, and the east side of Mahaska County. So um, I've spent a great deal of time on that, as well as um, some legislation, as some of you guys have saw with Rubens Rules, um, trying to work through that. Um, along with some economic development bills and preschool. Um, I'm on eight committees this year, and I have been asked to also do some technology oversight for our the state's mainframe system and some new HR systems we are putting into place. So um, we were lucky yesterday I spent some time at Vermeer learning their HR system to see how it would be integrated and work with ours um, and compare and look and learn. So it's definitely going well. We are busy and uh, thank you guys for being here. Well, good morning, Ken Rosenbaum. And I am having a hard time believing this is my eighth year I've been up here doing this, but it is the eighth year. Uh, let's start a little bit with housekeeping stuff. Uh, I have both Holly and Dustin's house district in my Senate district. So basically from Pella to Centerville, to the Missouri border, all are part of five counties. Number of well, committee assignments, I, I stay on the same committees I've been on. I'm on education, I'm on appropriations, I'm on agriculture, I'm on the Ag and Natural Resources Budget Subcommittee as the Vice Chairman. Uh, for some reason, I, this year, somebody got upset with me, apparently, and gave me another committee assignment, state government. I didn't ask for that, don't particularly want it, but I got it. And then I continue to serve on the Natural Resources and Environment Committee as the chairman. So that particular committee and that budget sub consume uh, an awful lot of my time. Now, a couple things I want to mention at the beginning. One is the... Uh, uh, simply, education funding is always at the top of everyone's mind at the beginning of the legislative year. And this year is no different. Uh, the governor put out her proposal on the second day of the session. Senate or, uh, uh, Republicans, we have a proposal. And I'm sure the House uh, Republicans also have a proposal. But I know more about the Senate side. In the Senate side, our proposal is to increase funding for K-12 education uh, by a total of just about $92 million a year. That does include the final piece of what we call transportation equity funding. Those schools, rural schools that have particularly high transportation costs 
have not been able, it's, it's not been fair because their dollars go to transportation instead of going to the classroom. So over the last three years, I think it is, we have bumped up, we've supported those rural schools uh, so they're not paying any more than the state average transportation costs. And this, I think, is the final year we do that. And that, that's about a $26 million a year bill that we pay. In addition to that, those in the education field know that there's been inequity in the per pupil funding. Again, we've started working on that. Uh, that's one, things, one of those things we have to take small bites over a long period of time to equalize everything. But we are working on that again this year. And I think that takes another five or six million dollars. And then uh, lastly, on the education side, Senator Sinclair, who is right to the west of us, Chair's Education Committee, um, is working on a piece of legislation to deal with classroom behaviors, classroom clears, as they're known, where where a child acts up and the rest of the class goes outside of the class, right? It disrupts their education. So that's rather complicated. It involves federal law, federal regulations, but Amy's up to the task. She has a good proposal. We passed that out of our Senate Education Committee, I believe, Wednesday. So that conversation will continue. The other thing I want to mention is the governor's, uh, probably her signature legislation this year she would like to have us consider is the what she is calling the uh, invest in iowa act 10 years ago 2010 iowans supported or voted for a, a referendum that if and when the state of iowa ever raised sales tax that three-eighths of a cent would go towards a new constitutionally protected fund called the Natural Resources and Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund. Say that fast three times. Um, but the legislature has never funded that in 10 years. And the reason's pretty obvious. Nobody likes to raise taxes. Nobody wants to pay more taxes and legislators don't like to raise taxes. So the, the uh, proposal the governor has, and it's one that I conceptually support is, uh, let's take a look at raising the sales tax one penny, so three eighths of that penny would go to this fund, and the other five eighths would go towards an offset tax decreases in income tax and to some degree property tax. So that's the 30,000 foot view of that. That conversation, the bill, I think yesterday or the day before, and so that conversation will begin I'm not involved like Dustin is on the ways and means on the tax side of this discussion. I am involved on the spending side of the discussion, how we would spend that money in that trust fund. As chairman of the, of the Senate Environmental uh, Natural Resources Committee, that falls on me to, to uh, work through those details. And I've been working on that actually for several months. Uh, then the last thing I'll mention, which is, I don't know, some of you know it and some of you probably don't. Uh, I just want to acknowledge it. Uh, it's become public knowledge now that I'm a target for a group of San Francisco-based animal rights activists. Uh, I'm a livestock producer. I'm a state senator that led a fight on ag protection bill last year, and they're trying to make me pay. So this began in April with a confrontation with me and them and my brother in separate things, separate events. At the time, we didn't know they'd already been in our buildings taking pictures and, and, and so forth, um, which they published a few weeks ago. So uh, I will just tell you that it's not fun being the poster child for animal cruelty everywhere. Uh, that's not who I am. I think you all know that, but uh, this is based in, uh, I don't know how to describe it other than lies, deceit, and intimidation. That's what's going on. They broke into my brother's farm last Saturday, just a week ago again, tore the curtain, cut the wire, and got inside. They don't know what for. They didn't. They did a couple thousand dollars damage. But uh, that has detracted, uh, that has distracted me just a bit here in the first couple of weeks of the session, the first four weeks. 
Uh, I'm willing to talk to anybody about that. I have nothing to hide. But uh, it's, for those of us in agriculture, and some of you, a lot of you in this room are, it's a huge issue because I'm not really their target. Animal agriculture is their target. They're trying to put meat producers, milk producers, egg producers out of business because that's their core belief. So be happy to answer any questions. I, don't, I hope we don't spend much time on that today, but I'm willing to talk to anybody anytime about animal production. With that, we'll turn it over to uh, Mayor Dave and whatever questions you have. Okay. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opening comments. And so as you are familiar with, this is the opportunity to ask questions, make comments. Uh, the, the standard rules, I'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, we want to know what your name is and uh, where you're from, so that way we have some sense of your perspective. If you live in town, out of town, if you're uh, from some distance away, uh, that's helpful for everyone who's listening to what you've got to say. I'll hang on to the microphones and make sure that we have a good sound quality as you're asking your questions and making comments. Who would like to ask the first question or make a comment? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, David. Eric Palmer from Oskaloosa. I just got a couple of notes here. I uh, handed out a few copies of an opinion piece from the register. Uh, this is a story of one of the uh, uh, beneficiaries of Medicaid, and I hope you'll take time to read it. And if you need a copy, I can get you one after afterwards. But this is this is somebody who knows intimately about what Medicaid privatization has done to islands. Uh, Medicaid privatization was passed by Governor Branstad, what, two or three years ago, and supported by a Republican legislature, and it turned over Medicaid entirely to private out-of-state corporations and took it away from the state. Uh, it, this has been an issue at the last two eggs and issues. In fact, we had providers up here last time. There were five different providers, and uh, I think at best they thought it's been a disaster. Uh, they're not getting paid takes them nine to 12 months to get paid. I'm, an, I'm a private business person. And if I have to wait nine to 12 months to get paid, I'm in deep trouble. And that's what these folks are talking about. And uh, not only are they not getting paid, but there are less dollars to provide services for their clients. Um, once again, Governor Reynolds and the Republican, Republican legislature are in charge. And so I've got to call on them to fix this problem. Uh, this is a failed experiment. And uh, we need to turn it back over to the state where it will be cheaper and provide uh, better services to the patients. So uh, the three of you, uh, I mean, we can, we can go ahead and deal with the symptoms, which there are plenty. Or we can look for a cure, which is to turn it to the state. Uh, are any of you contemplating returning this program to the state, or are we just going to continue to deal with the symptoms? Well, Eric, I'm not surprised you asked that question. <clears throat> and frankly, we don't have enough time, you and I, this group doesn't have enough time, for you and I to get into the weeds, deep weeds on all of this, and, you, and we all know that. But I, I, I'm going to try to uh, respond to you. Uh, first of all, it was not the Republican legislature. The Senate, uh, Senate was controlled by Democrats when that happened. So let's clarify that. Nor was it even a legislative process. It was, a, it was an executive decision by Governor Burns. Okay. Well, but that illustrates the problem here. We want to point fingers, make charges and accusations without all the facts. The truth is, something had to be done. And, and I will try to give, my, I tend to go to 30,000 foot views. We can get into the weeds of numbers all day long. In 2005, and I think you were in the legislature then, Eric. No. Okay, whatever. Before and after that, you were. We were spending, the state of Iowa was spending $423 million a year on Medicaid. That's Iowa taxpayer. It's not kind of the federal match. That's Iowans. Ten years later, 2015, we were spending $1.31 billion. That number had tripled in ten years. That's why Governor Branstad had to do something to make it sustainably to make it affordable for Iowans. So this is a piece of the state budget that grew in that 10 years from 9% of the state budget to 19% of the state budget. 
That was the problem that Governor Branstad and House and House Democrats and Senate Democrats threw at Governor Branstad's feet. So that's where we were when Branstad took over. He responded by making an executive decision, decision to uh, change how we uh, manage Medicaid in the state. Everyone, me, Governor Branstad, Governor Reynolds, have often st stated the obvious. It was not done well. It was rolled out in a clumsy fashion. There were lots of problems. I dealt with hundreds of calls and emails on it. The, but the good news is that's mostly behind us. The rocky road is smoothed out a lot. I haven't had a complaint on it myself for a number for quite some time. But Eric just mentioned the panel that was here a couple weeks ago. I wasn't here, but I read about it. What little I read, uh, Eric, you're right. They they said everything's broken, right? Last night, I was going through the mail and I got my Iowa County magazine. As a former super, uh, supervisor, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with this magazine and. As a state legislator, I get it regularly. But the allegation that the system's broken, broken and not working is simply not accurate. Here's a two sentences from a county supervisor in eastern Iowa who said, we are fortunate in our, in our region, the mental health region, if you build it, they will come. This is what we worked hard, so hard to achieve. We have tripled the number of citizens being served in the region since our base was set in 2014, while providing costlier mandated services. So we have a county supervisor, Eric, that says we've tripled the number of people we're serving under the current system. And that has a cost. The state, it's my responsibility, the governor's responsibility, to the taxpayer of Iowans to keep these costs under control. So it's easy to say the system's broken. It's only you notice it's the providers telling us that. It's not it's not the recipients of Medicaid that come come to me. And I acknowledge your problems. But the governor and the legislature are watching over that. And that's why they withheld payment of forty four million dollars to one of the MCOs to make sure that they're doing business the way they should be. Well, Eric, it's always great to see you here, as you know. Um, I, I just first have a simple question for you. Um, I assume you got permission to distribute, to copy and distribute the Des Moines Register's copyrighted uh, article here? They can sue me. That's a little lawyer humor uh -oh. for you folks. Um, Senator Rosenboom is right about the cost of this thing. Uh, Medicaid has become a larger and larger and larger part of the state budget to when you add in Medicaid and education that takes up and Representative Brink will know this almost 80% of our entire state budget that leaves 20% of our entire state budget to take care of roads prisons the highway patrol the court system all of the other things that we have to do as a state government and so we have to look at those things from both sides. Um, Eric, you and I both do tax returns for people, um, and that's what I do on. That's what I've been doing for the past couple hours before I came in here. Um, the money we're talking about is your money. It's Iowans' taxpayers' money, uh, hard-earned money, and so we have to be conscious of that. Now, to the issue of the system being broken, as as you say. Um, I've told providers, and I will continue to tell providers, if you have issues being paid, come to me, and I know these two will say the same thing. The entire time I've been a state representative, that's happened twice. One of them wasn't even my constituent. Those people, those providers were paid shortly thereafter. And so I hear this, but if you're a provider, bring those issues to me because nobody is. Um, I said the entire time I've been it, twice. And I, and I regularly send emails at least to my two hospitals, Pella and, and Mahaska County, saying, bring this information to me. Um, 
so when we, we look at all this, it, it's our job to make sure that we're doing the best for Iowans, but also uh, spending Iowans taxpayers' money wisely. And so that's, that's what we're doing. Is the system perfect? No. Are there improvements to be made? Absolutely. And Mr. Palmer, your office is there, my office is there. Anytime you want to walk across the square or even call me and come over, I'll be happy to listen to solutions that you have. Um, and you don't have to wait till February to come say I'm here. And I'll just kind of go on with what both of these guys have already said. I mean, in 2014, when the ACA hit, it changed the mandates of what we're allowed to do for subsidies. A family of four making $96,000 would now be allowed to have some subsidies. It raised the amount of people that were taking that, raised the amount of people that were using it. And, and yes, processes went slower. But we also can take into consideration that if any of us that had a third more work to do just dropped on us overnight, it would take longer. And so we are working, we are improving. Um, I'm the same, I've had two, we've got them paid out. Um, and so I, we are working on it and it is, it is coming around and there's, you know, every day there seems to be less issues or concerns and um, we are still continually improving. Um, so, thank you. Parting comment, uh, the people aren't getting paid. Uh, the panel that was here said they were not getting paid. Our local hospital, the administrator said they've been waiting on over 400,000 for nine to 12 months. That is just a broken system. Uh, patients aren't getting services, but the worst part is, instead of paying uh, state workers here locally, we send the profit off the top, we skim that off the top to some out-of-state corporation. Just bring it back to the state make it cheaper, provide better services, make sure the providers get paid in a reasonable amount. Next comment. Chris Elgin, Oskaloosa. You say the legislature say there isn't a problem. I have a daughter-in-law who works in Iowa City for a group that she does most of their insurance forms. And she said it's the worst mess she's ever been in to try and get money from these private companies. Her clients are the ones who are suffering. And so it may work just fine, as the legislature says, or as the insurance company says, but for the people in the trenches who are actually doing this job, it is not working. And I was here about three years ago when there was a lady here from um, Illinois. She was in the medical profession. And she said, we started this in Illinois, and it's not working. And she told the legislatures that day, oh, it's going to be different, it's going to be different. Well, I have an aunt that moved to Oskaloosa from Illinois about three years ago, and she says all the things that she's reading now is just what she read in Illinois before she moved here. So it's not working for the people who need it. So, so once again, you know, I, I've said to my providers, and, and I think Representative Brink and Senator Rosenboom would say the same thing, it, nine to 12 months for payment is unacceptable. I don't think a single one of us says that it is. Um, if those issues are happening, contact us directly, and we will make sure that they are not. Um, and and I've, I've thrown that out there, and I'll continue to throw that out there. And, and to follow up, uh, I, this is my eighth year. I was in the legislature when this happened. It wasn't pretty the first year. I, I told you I had literally had hundreds of phone calls and emails, primarily emails, and I went through every one of those, and we got answers, and we got solutions. Uh, but that is slow to a trickle. Uh, frankly, I can't even remember the last one from a Medicaid recipient. Good, mor oh, good morning. Good uh, morning. Bill Morg is my name, and I live in Oskaloosa. And I was going to mention, I was going to mention that uh, 2020 hindsight is easy. And now we're seeing what the value is, delayed paperwork, or who the clients are who's suffering, uh, relatives of the treated or the treated. I uh, have listened to uh, 
a lot of uh, history, like the McLaughlin Report and the local radios. And they talked about when uh, President Reagan didn't mind having a microphone in. And I'm assuming it just released all of the mentally ill into the world. And what great events was it that it just went past us real fast because rock and roll was just so fabulous in the early 80s. And, and there was Tenement Square. And right now we have the, the Corona's disease. We had about 100 people coming over here. And then, uh, there's a paper just here in the last week, a man, a young man and his wife. And what are, are, they was over in China, is that correct? Specific well, it was one to throw out the hindsight is 2020. That was it. Bill Benson, Oskaloosa. Uh, I've been coming to Eggs and Issues since the meetings started over at the mall in a small office. And if we had 20 people, the place was crowded. Look around you now, and there's a pretty good crowd. What we're seeing right now is that we only get to see you twice in the six-week session. We're not going to see you at all in March. And as far as I'm concerned, that's unacceptable because you don't really accomplish anything until either March or even later to the, extend the session. Quite frankly, I'd like to see exit issues continue until the legislature is done. You don't need to comment on that. That's just my comment. So, so I, I, I would like to point out we don't have anything to do with eggs and issues. Um, I think the only thing we said this year was we can't do it the second Saturday in March because we have the county convention. Um, I would encourage everybody, uh, you know, shoot us an email. Come, come up and visit with us uh, at the Iowa State Capitol. We're happy to talk with you there um, anytime. Even, well, Eric's left. But even he came up to see us in the Capitol last year. Hi, Kevin Durandi, Administrator at uh, Mahaska Health. And uh, so we've lived the MCO piece, and so I want to thank Dustin and his office. Uh, I was in contact with him and his team. He introduced us to people that could help us get paid. And so we've received that payment, and we really appreciate it, Dustin, so thank you. Just a comment, um, uh, Kyle Brown from Oscar said, uh, doesn't it seem odd though that you would have to go to a legislative to get paid for your job? I mean, that seems silly. I don't have to contact my legislation to get paid for a catering that I do. Um, sorry, that's just more of a comment than anything. I'm glad that you got paid. It's great, but that still seems unacceptable. So We get contacted by hundreds of people throughout the year on every issue you can imagine, sir. It's, yeah, it's not unusual. Um, Su Susie Card from Pella, and not uh, to change the topic, but here's another symptom you're trying to uh, put a Band-Aid on um, and not addressing the cure, but Senate uh, Study Bill uh, 3080 and House Study Bill uh, 598, hopefully you've read them, uh, but it's to address classroom behaviors and and I, I'm glad you're starting a conversation because it needs to be started. Um, I taught for 15 years, and now I represent teachers. And now I hear story after story of teachers getting punched, getting bit, associates getting punched, getting bit. The issue is the mental health of some of these kids are not being met. Schools can't afford counselors in every building, they can't afford nurses in every building. Um, what's suggested is um, right now uh, classrooms are cleared when a kid is having a violent episode, but the bill says, well, let's just notify the parents of all the kids in the classroom. Well, okay, as a parent, your kid, you find out that happens, the first thing you're going to say is, I don't want you hanging around Kenny because he has fits. So now you're alienating the kid who has the mental health issues. 
then you're going to have parents that go, well, I want my kid pulled out of Kenny's classroom. Now you're affecting administrators to say, no, we, we don't do that. Usually in those cases, they don't do that. And then you're going to go, I, I don't know if this is your secret plan, but then parents are going to go, well, I'm going to put them in a private school that usually don't take kids like Kenny. Okay? So there's ripple effects to this bill. So I hope you, I mean, there's FERPA issues. Suddenly Kenny's name gets out there in the community. And I'm not saying you, Kenny. I'm just saying the special ed kid or whatever kid that is having problems. <laughs> Um, I don't know your background, but I'm just saying uh, there's, it's a good conversation to start because I've seen just this year I had a nine-month pregnant teacher get punched in the stomach. I mean, I'm seeing horrendous things that people should not have to go to work to get and get beat up. That is not an expectation of anybody in this, in this, in this hall with their job. But I think the conversation needs to involve educators. Um, uh, Senator Rosenblum, I put out there to set up a meeting with teachers, you know, and I respect administrators, but I think teachers, just meeting with teachers alone is a little more productive because they're going to feel a little more free to say things. Because just yesterday I heard from a teacher who was told by her administrator, we cannot do any more classroom, uh, uh, ha having kids all out of the classroom again. So it's rippling down to really affect things right now. So please, I appreciate the conversation. Maybe there needs to be a committee to look into this before you start passing bills like that. Thank you. I can address this. Um, house study bill, um, what you were just talking about, we actually did last Wednesday night the House. We had a 6 o'clock at night subcommittee meeting. I did address all my schools and encouraged them. I sent it to several teachers that I actually had their personal contact with and encouraged them to come up. Oskaloosa superintendent showed up for the meeting to help and to bring a voice. Um, I reached out because that's what we wanted. We wanted individuals that were in the trenches of this, dealing with this, to come to the table, and several of them came. Um, it might not have been ideal at 6 o'clock on a Wednesday night, but that was the best option we could do it, that could get several people there. And there was individuals. And like I said, Paula, if you're here, I appreciate you coming up um, and to help bring some, you know, insight from what we're dealing with. This is a huge issue and it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. Um, I actually just spoke at an ACES board conference, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and we worked through that. Um, they contacted me again and I'm going to be speaking with some individuals from Lutheran Services trying to encourage that um, and looking for resources. Um, we have so many issues going on and I think that that's what we all need to also understand is yes there's mental health, there's entitlement issues, there is um, resiliency issues we need to work on. This is so many layers of things that are going on. And Amy Sinclair did take the charge. She spent a great amount of time traveling and looking. She went to Winterset, who has a, a great facility that they work through and how they're doing that. Um, but what we also need to know, and I'm going to reach out to you guys, is have you contacted your local school and asked if there's anything you can do to help? I think that is a crucial part. This is You cannot blame teachers, you cannot blame students, you cannot blame just administrators. This is going to take a community to fix. We can't legislate out of this. Um, there are students that just need some, you know, not work. Have you reached out to, to be a peer friend? I know that there's been a few people in our community that have done that, and it's great. But this is something we cannot 100% legislate out. This is going to take a community working together and building relationships and encouraging to get through this. We can do our part. We are open to suggestions. I have met with all of my superintendents on this, um, or at least talked about them. I've talked to several teachers who are in the classroom. How do they want to see handled it? It's down to an education. The day we had a discussion of, is it more traumatic to clear 19 kids and leave one, or is it better to remove one? And you know, and there's difference of opinion on that. One individual said, do you know what it would be like for that, how traumatic it would be like for that child or the kids to sit there and see one child be removed? A teacher says, do you know how traumatic it is for kindergartners who just spent all this time on this amazing project to send to mom and take home to so mom and they had to clear and watch that project get destroyed? So there's a lot of things that we have to think about. And, and I know all of us have been reaching out and trying to work through that. And there's always two sides to that. I mean, That's just in a simple example of, do you remove 19 or do you remove one? And so, um, you know, 
know, this is something we do encourage you to get involved. I'm sure there's going to be other subcommittees. Um, and so it, it's a lot going on. So feel free to email us with thoughts. Sorry, I don't mean to seem so impatient. Susie, ironically, you and I are on the base, both on the same exact side in this. We really are. No. Yeah, we may, we, you may have a hard time accepting that. But this is, Amy worked so hard. She worked with legisl with, uh, with teachers, with administrators, with the AEAs. Amy's a very intense and thorough person. Her husband's a grade school principal. Um, but... We're trying to come alongside teachers. We recognize that those behavior problems sometimes lead to injuries and, and physical violence for teachers. That's a piece of this bill. I have the whole bill here with me, Susie. You can look at it. Also, the amendment we passed in the Education Committee Wednesday afternoon. I have that with me. Uh, we, I'll say this on behalf of Amy, she listens to everybody and, and since the initial subcommittee meeting, she's made the changes that were needed to comply with, with uh, the wishes of, of the education establishment, with the wishes of parents, with, with the demands of the federal regulations that we deal with. So I really think this is the type of legislation that all Iowans should be behind. And uh, as, as Representative Brink says, we can't fix everything of that. We know the limitations we have as a legislature to, f to fix this type of thing. But we're sure coming alongside the teaching establishment to do that. And while I got the microphone, I see my friend, Senator Marionette Miller Meeks, walked into the room. And I just have to say hi to her. She sits right across the aisle from me. It's good to see you, Senator. Um. So I have to say that I have personally implemented a policy where every day I talk to a teacher who works in the public school and ask her how the day went. For those of you who don't know, my wife's a public school teacher. Um, so th this is absolutely an issue um, that is dear to all of us. I don't think a single person in this room thinks that our students or our teachers or our administrators or our school staff should have to go to school on a day and wonder if they are going to be physically injured. I don't think there's a single person in this room that thinks that ought to be happening. We want these conversations to happen. Um, I, I, I'm aware that the conversations on these bills have started in the, in the, um, in the teacher workrooms, and, and that's what we want, and we want feedback from those. Are these perfect? Are these the solution? Um, they might be, they may not be. I, I don't know. I will tell you, um, sitting in front of me is a Democrat representative from the Cedar Rapids area. She's a Cedar Rapids uh, teacher who teaches at-risk at uh, students, Molly Donahue. And for the past couple weeks, uh, her and I are usually some of the first ones in the, in the chamber. We have a conversation about every morning about student behavior and what we can do to fix it. And I will tell you, Again, this is her life. We haven't really come up with a solution. And so we want these conversations to continue. And certainly those of, those of you involved in the field um, come to us with ideas, come to us with, with solutions. I have one idea. <laughs> is you fund public education where it needs to be. Two and a half percent is not enough. We got in this situation because... Um, when I read uh, your bulletins, Senator Rosenboom, we have funded, we have fully met our obligation in what we funded. Yeah, but it wasn't enough. And then the other um, thing you always say is we funded it a little more than the year before. Well, if I put a dollar more in my savings than the year before, then yeah, I, I gave myself a, a dollar raise there. It is not even keeping up with the cost of living. So that's where the problem has started. And classes are getting bigger. You know, I, I was also a BD teacher in Des Moines. It, it's not, those kids are not going to go away. When we went to school, those kids dropped out. But we now deal with them. But there's a lot of mental health issues that need to be addressed in this bill. Thanks. So to address that, because I know school funding is always something that all of us are concerned on. In the last 10 years, the state of Iowa through SSA and some of these other equity funding things, have added almost one 
billion dollars to K-12 education. If our if the House Republican proposal uh, is is adopted this year, uh, which would be 108 million new dollars to K through 12 education, uh, just for those of you uh, in this room, uh, for North Mahaska, that would be 2.9 million dollars. For Oskaloosa, that would be 16 million dollars. For Pella, it'd be 14 million dollars. Eddyville, 4.6 million dollars. Knoxville, 13.6. Linville Sully, $2.9 million, and Twin Cedars, $2.4 million. Education is important to Republicans. I think it's important to all of Iowans. Um, almost $1 billion new dollars. I'll also just add the fact that in the last few years, we've never had a deappropriate from education. The one year we did, it did, we had to do a deappropriation. It didn't come from education. We left it there because we followed through with our promises. If you want to go back and look at some numbers, I mean, I can promise you 10%. You're still only going to get what the budget allows. So you think about that. Do you want to be told what you're going to get so you know what to work with? Or would you like to be told some bogus number and then have to deappropriate like they did in 02, promised a 4%, and then it was a 4.3 decrease? You in the hole. In 2003, 4%, you ended up with 1. In 2004, 4% allowable growth, yet a 2.5% decrease. How about 2010? We were promised 4%, and it was a 10% cut. We told you last year you're going to get 2.06. You got 2.06, so you can make preparations for that. So would you rather us say we'll give you X, Y, and Z and only get what the budget allows, because we can't go over. I think that is a very important thing to look at. I think it's also important to look at that... When you break down the numbers, if we go with the 2.5%, let's talk about 2.5% of what? He just said an extra billion dollars. Well, 2.5% 10 years ago isn't near the dollar amount as 2.5% is now. So let's look at 2.5% of what? If we want to break it down, it's $15,050 per student. If you really want to break it down, the state of Iowa is investing $13.94 per hour, per every student in a seat while they are in school hours, which is 1,080 hours. $13.94 an hour for every single student. Is it enough? No one's ever told me exactly what is enough, but we are improving. He said a billion dollars. That is mass amounts. We're helping now with transportation per pupil equity. We are going in there. We are moving. 2.06 last year. The proposal this year is 2.5. You know, that hasn't, we haven't necessarily settled on where we're going to end at, but it is moving, and we are coming through with our promises. I think that is a very important thing. Again, I can promise you whatever, but it doesn't matter if you're not going to get it. I think it's more important that we're following through and doing what we're saying, so you know how to plan. Well, I don't want to uh, prolong this too much farther, but my first newsletter a couple weeks ago addressed the same thing. Right here I have 50 copies of a piece of paper that I'd like to have any of you that want. Grab one. What it is, these are not my numbers, these are from LSA. They're real numbers. What they show you, and, and, and we, we, we hear all the time about fully funding education. We actually hear that in other areas too. But nobody can define what fully funding means. So we've, what we did, what we had LSA to go back and look uh, uh, at, at some history here. Uh, right now, Republicans control the state legislature. We control the House, the Senate, and the uh, governor's office. We have the trifecta, that's called. So we have three years of that. We have a three-year history. When was the last trifecta in the Iowa legislature? It was about 10 years ago when the Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the governor's chair. In, those th in that three-year period, Education was promised, K-12 education was promised uh, a total of $459 million new money for a three-year period. That's not right. They were promised $394 million. They didn't get the $394 million. What they did was lost $65 million. 
That's where the 459 came from. In that three year period, education, K-12 education, was actually, the, the dollars were lowered by $65 million a year. Now let's move forward 10 years to the next trifecta where me and conservative Republicans have set the budget. In that three year period, we promised $264 million of new money. And we've delivered every penny of it. There have been no cuts. It has been regularly uh, funded at higher levels year to year. And we have kept every promise we've made. That's what we think fully funding means, is that you promise what you can deliver and you deliver what you can promise. And you can all have a copy of this if you want to look at it. And uh, challenge is on us, but the numbers are solid. Uh, Mike Long here in Oski. And I'm concerned about the I will uh, one set sales tax that will possibly be put into place. On the surface, I'm for it. Uh, it was passed 10 years ago with a lot of support, overwhelming support, but it's never been funded, obviously. Now, I've also read where the only way this is going to happen is if other taxes can be cut to at least offset that amount or possibly more. Therefore, if you cut even more, less income is coming into the state, which means certain programs will be cut and or underfunded. Uh, a, do you have a list of what programs those will be? And also, as a true conservationist, I've been involved with conservation for years and years and years. The program is badly needed, but as a citizen, a retired citizen, fixed income, I do know that the set increase of sales tax will hurt me more than it will the $7,500,000 wage earners. I'm willing to pay it if the funding formula that was set up originally in that program is not changed and we do not cut funding for other programs. They're pointing me, uh, Mike. I understand the question. First of all, to your point about uh, a, a offsetting tax decrease to compensate for the sales tax increase assumes uh, that the state doesn't grow. Our policies have been focused directly on growing the state, the economic base of the state, which more than makes up for tax cuts. And I think our record since we implemented those tax cuts just says that we're doing the right thing and we're heading in the right direction. So it's not a zero-sum game. That, that, that's the first point. To your point about the formula, um, that's the part that I've been working on with all the environmental groups, with the governor's office, and with the House since July or August, I think. And we've met regularly with all the stakeholders at the table. Um, the formula will change. If it does not change, I will, or invest in Iowa, whatever name we want to put on it, will not advance. It's just a simple fact of life. That formula will not um, be part of a new package. And, and the reason for that is really pretty simple. The people, uh, the, the folks in 2010 that presented that referendum with that formula that passed, never ever had the courage to actually call for a tax increase to fund the formula. So those that said this is what we need to do and this is how we need to do it never pulled the trigger to actually fund it. Ten years later, a lot has changed. The governor has changed, the legislature has changed, and those of us like me and you that are interested in our resources and conservation. I, I'm taking a long, hard look at this. I've been supportive of, of having this conversation, but that formula simply is a problem because uh, talk was cheap. Uh, it's easy to put numbers up on the board when you have no intention of funding them. We're talking about actually funding that, and that will impact the, uh, the formula. But it will impact the formula, I believe, in a very positive way. 
So uh, thanks for the question, Mike. This was actually going to be part of my closing comments. Um, I want to hear people's thoughts on this. So I've got right here the governor's bill. I got it on Thursday. Um, uh, Representative Jane Bloomingdale and I met with the governor's staff late Thursday afternoon, early Thursday evening to kind of go over this. There's a whole bunch of moving parts to this, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you today where I stand on this because I don't know, and I want to hear from you guys. Um, because part of it, the part that I find interesting, is the tax policy. And the tax policy is we raise the one cent sales tax, and then we use part of that to cut income tax. We also use part of that to take over some of the mental health funding from the counties. Um, and then uh, the counties will decrease their property tax uh, levies. Not to get too much into the weeds, but one of my questions is, and it's just, it's just too early in the process to know, is what does that mean for the mental health funding for my district, which includes this area and over in Pella? And I don't, I don't know that yet. Um, there's also some incentives in the governor's bill for uh, rural doctors uh, getting residents, uh, so med students uh, training them. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to this. And I would encourage you all, as you, as you read on it, as you, as you learn about it, come talk to us and let us know your thoughts, because uh, we represent you, and, and, and that's what we need to know. I'm also in the same, um, in the same situation. I'd like to hear from you guys. I have sat through the presentation. Um, Dave Roeder, who works for the governor's office, broke it down where the, the formula that they'd like to see, how it works. Um, <coughs> I've also been called to the governor's office prior to the bill dropping um, just to discuss any thoughts or concerns. If there's any different ideas that we have thought of um, as an appropriation. So the chair, Representative Moore, myself, um, we were down there discussing the bill is dropped now. I think you said Thursday afternoon you got a copy of it. I think I got it Friday morning. Um, I'm still working through it. You know, there's, there's pros and cons. There's different ways to think of this. One of the areas is with the one cent sales tax. People from out of state then would help fund some of this, about 20%. So that's something else we have to think about. Um, where you said, you know, we wouldn't be paying as much because it would be dropping down. But we'd also have income coming from out of state when they come and spend money in Iowa. They can offset that. Um, but I really would encourage you guys to take a look. Let us know. Reach out to us. It can be as simple as, please don't do this. Please do this. What about this? Um, and so, thank you. We have, we have time. We have time for one more question. Who would like to finish this up tonight, today? Paul Grunholm, Area Grain and Livestock Producer. I want to express my sympathy to Ken Rosenbaum on the livestock confinement issue. And the topic I have today it was back a bit in the last year. During my many years of observing our state legislative sessions, the 2019 session was remarkable when it became obvious that elected monopoly had control of the Iowa Republican Party. Proof I offers our so-called conservative legislators and their weekly press releases never mentioning any pending anti-solar legislation. After that, on a Monday afternoon without having a public hearing, the public control Senate, after exempting a commercial solar project, passed a bill that would effectively in private installation of solar cells. The following morning at eggs and issues, our legislators justified the bill's passage with reasoning that the solar tax incentive justified an increase in the metering fee. To their shame, they never pointed out that Mid-America's 2,300 windmills are financed by the American taxpayers. My question is, how likely is it that Senate File 583, House File 669, bills written by Mid-American Energy be revised and passed by both Senate and House without the public's knowledge and input. Well, Paul, I'm, I'm not surprised you brought that up. Uh, you warned us last year you would. We, you, you and I disagree on this, Paul. I, I, I will first of all dispense with the, uh, the, the often uh, made charge that we do things secretly or behind closed doors. Well, but it, those of us that work up there and go to subcommittee meetings and walk out into the rotunda and, and get accosted by dozens of people as we walk across uh, have a hard time 
understanding why the charge is ever made that we do things in the dark of night or in secret, because if this isn't the most open process in the world, I don't know what is. Uh, why didn't they hold a hearing? They, we hold hearings. We have to. But, Paul, Paul, sub, every piece of legislation starts with a subcommittee hearing, which all the uh, lobbyists, all the stakeholders on any bill know about in advance. There's a 24-hour notice rule, and that is honored. And it's amazing to those of us how fast word spreads in 24 hours about a subcommittee being held. I've seen the Capitol packed, busloads of people coming in practically overnight, and it happens, Paul. So no, there, there's no credibility to this idea that we do things secretly. To your point about the tax credit, uh, that's where you and I disagree. Uh, between the federal and state tax credits on solar energy, uh, the taxpayer is putting a big portion of that installation already. And this piece will have to do with the transmission of that energy, uh, which I believe uh, should be borne by the generator of that energy. But we'll disagree. We can't get into all the weeds now. But uh, I respect your point of view. I hope you respect mine. I remember you hired it for me a year ago. You probably vote for House File 669. You still had the same opinion of that bill. If it's the one I'm thinking about, Paul, which I assume it is because we had this conversation, um, uh, yes, I, I don't know, you know, obviously it, it didn't come up in the House last year, so I, I don't know where it's at this year. Um, to, to back up what Senator Rosenboom says, we simply cannot put every single bill in our newsletters. They would become so long and boring that the papers wouldn't publish them. I mean, there's thousands of bills that get filed every year. We just simply cannot put every single one in there. Um, if you have a question or, or if there's a question about a specific bill, email us. Um, but if you're just curious as to what, what bills are filed, um, every day, legis.iowa.gov, you can track every single bill throughout the process. As Senator Rosenboom said, we have public hearings there every day, Democrats, Republicans, Nothing in that building goes on in secret. Um, I, will, I will promise you that. But you have not answered my question. How would you vote on House File 669? I, I thought I did. I, I, I don't know that my opinion has changed on it. Okay. That gets us to the end of the question period. Uh, do you guys have any kind of parting comments that you would like to say? Um, I'll just say thank you for all your support again. Thank you for being involved and in coming to this. Um, how he said everything is, you can actually log on and watch live. You can't see subcommittees live, cause, but you can see anything during debate on the floor um, of the Senate or the House live. Bills, you can read them here. This Our website is absolutely amazing. You can even see my schedule or his schedule. If you know what, you can see what committees we're on. You can see the schedule of those. Um, and I encourage you to do so. Subcommittees are open, not, I mean, individuals can come. If there's something that you feel is important and you want to come, you are more than welcome to do so. They're, post, they're posted on the website. Um, you can follow bills. You can follow lots of different stuff. And so I encourage you to learn how to work this website. It's amazing. You can even look at what um, district somebody's from. If you know they're going to have a vote on something, you can look at what district they're from, um, the areas. Um, pictures so you can recognize things so um, I you know get on there take a look it's important um, again on the I will or the invest in I will, let me know how you feel about that what your opinions are thoughts or if you have any other ideas or solutions um, I think that's important so thank you guys so again I want to thank our, our sponsors and, and uh, Mayor Kretzfeld for doing this um, you know I, again encourage anybody to come up let us know you're coming up to the Capitol We'd love to see you there. Um, email us, contact us, thoughts, comments, questions. Uh, we're all happy to address those. I really want to know, as, as I think Representative Brink said as well, what you guys think on, on the Governor's Invest in Iowa proposal um, or, or any other topic uh, that you guys are concerned about. So thank you. Again, add a lot to that. Just uh, want to say thank you for coming. It's an honor to represent, to represent Senate District 40 in the Iowa Senate. Uh, it's it's this democracy thing, right? It's it's a it's a messy deal, right? It's like 
We see sausage being made every day. It's still a wonderful system. And I respect that system. I hope you do too. And encourage you to uh, contact me or any of us uh, at any time. We're not, uh, if you do this job, you find out you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> And so that brings us to the end of Eggs and Issues this morning. Once again, we want to say thank you to the American Legion for the presentation of the colors. Uh, we want to acknowledge and thank KBOE, KMZN for their coverage of this event. Also, Oskaloosa News, Oskaloosa Herald, and the new Sharon Sun for their coverage. Uh, Smoky Row for providing the venue. Uh, Midwest One Bank for the coffee. And then also George Daly Auditorium for the sound system. And so... Um, uh, Senator Miller Meeks just reminded me, I'm sorry I didn't think of this sooner, talking about an open, transparent system, Governor Reynolds will be in this room Wednesday at 2.30, so if you want to meet with the governor, if you want to have this same dialogue with her, she will be here Wednesday at 2.30. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. I forgot to say that. And so with that... Thank you, everyone, for being here. We appreciate your participation. We'll see you at the next Exit Issues in a couple of weeks. Have a good day.